Global Affairs Journalism Panel discussion. I would ask that you please turn off your cell phones at this time. And I want you to know that all the questions asked this evening are student-generated questions. Our moderator tonight is going to be Betty Thomas from the Speech Department. And I'll turn this over to Betty. Hi. <laughs> I'm Betty, of course. Uh, I'm glad you all could come, and I hope some other people will be able to come as well. We have a lot of really different, varied journalists here from different kinds of venues. And I'm going to ask each of them, starting to my right, to introduce themselves and tell who they represent and anything else they want to tell you about themselves. I'm Tom Robot. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Portfolio Weekly. Uh, it's what's known in the industry as an alternative weekly, uh, which is a tradition going back to the counterculture of the 60s. Um, it's the best job I've ever had. I'm Lisa Finner, and I'm a reporter with the Daily Press. Uh, I've been with the paper since 1991. I've uh, reported on business, and I've been an editor and senior editor, and right now I'm a general side. I'm Leon Brown, a multi-media uh, specialist with Northrop Grumman. I've been there for about three months now. Uh, before that, I worked at Wavy TV for three years. I was a Peninsula reporter. I worked with Lisa very strongly. I worked at the Daily Press. And, uh, I actually graduated from Thomas Nelson in 98. So. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Steve Thompson from Virginia Gazette, which is a twice-weekly paper in Williamsburg. Uh, I've been a journalist for about uh, 21 years. Uh, I've worked at Dailies. I've also been press secretary and, and worked for nonprofits over the course of that time. I'm Barbara Ham. I'm chief communications officer at WHRO, responsible for marketing and public relations. Prior to that, I was a news director at WDKR Channel 3. I started my career back in 1978. Uh, producing uh, talk shows, and uh, I've had my entire career in television. I'm Bill Nack, and I'm a reporter for the Gloucester Matthews Gazette Journal, based in Gloucester County. I have 30 years professional reporting experience, having worked for a daily paper in Savannah, Georgia, and several papers here in the Tidewater market. And I cover county government, business, and a wide range of other topics on our smaller staff. Barbara forgot to tell you that one of her jobs was working for Oprah. When she was the little O, I was working with Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> well, she didn't know it Oh, okay. So, we had a lot of claim to do. Uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to initially ask one question and ask each of the people to respond to the first question. And then after that, some of the other questions, hopefully they'll just jump in. Hopefully not more than two minutes or so each. I don't want to have to be rude and cut people off. I didn't bring my time cards. I used to speech class tonight. But I'm sure that they'll, they'll deal with that. And then a little later, we'll open to questions from the floor. So, OK, my first question, who would like to begin? Which end would you like to We'll start with Mr. Nett. That's right. We'll start with him. Sorry. Uh, what form of journalism do you think is the most effective in today's culture? Newspaper, magazine, televised media? It's a trick question in a way because each of the panelists is very important and each of us represent very important media. <laughs> Television provides an instant coverage that the other media, the printed publications, could not. But in television, in a general sense, faces time restrictions. So therefore, quite often, there still is a place for both daily papers, weekly, twice a week as Mr. Long is with. So there really is a need for all of them to give you a focus to pull and pick and choose how much material you want. Do you want skim the surface? Do you want detail? Do you want local news that may affect you and your pocketbook, which the television station may be giving you news about the budget in office. You live in Gloucester and you're not getting the news that affects your county equally because if the publication, if the TV station has to look at what is its target audience, each of the media has a slightly different target audience. Um, I think that all of it's critical because I think in order to be a well-rounded person, you need to explore all different 
all types of media get all types of opinions um, and information from various sources so that you can make an informed opinion about things that are going on. So I don't think there's any one media that overtakes another. Um, obviously, my partiality is the TV because that's been my background, but, um, and I think television news has a, a very uh, critical role, especially in um, breaking news situations um, or in situations such as 9-11 or the collapse of the bridge in Minnesota, you know, et cetera, in terms of the immediacy, but for the in-depth interview, how we sit here, for the background, for the other side of the story, for the rest of the story, you need to read newspapers, magazines, online, uh, blogs, etc. I think that different media do different things well. TV news is great at who, what, when, where. You need to know that right now. Then they're great at that. They're terrible at the questions why and so what. You know, why did it happen and what's it mean? That's not something they do well on TV because they don't have time to do it. Um, whereas newspapers, magazines, and I would group online as the print media because you've got to read it. Um, the, the print media has an, has an advantage there when you do have the time and generally they're set up a little different than TV people are. TV reporters, TV does not have a strong beat system as print journalism, so TV reporters tend to be more generalist. They don't have as much uh, knowledge of a certain subject as, as a print reporter does usually. Yeah, I, I agree with that. We had to know something, a, a little bit of everything, you know, different stories. Uh, if I could say something that's most effective right now, say the internet. Just if you wanted to pick, I think every the form of uh, media is important, but right now the internet probably, because you can check the internet everywhere to find news. You, know, you can check it on your cell phone, you can check it at work. I'm not supposed to check it. <laughs> you can check it everywhere, check it at home, so I believe it because it's a good journalist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you can look at our TV websites, you can look at newspaper websites. It, so right now, just as far as being the most effective, I think, news, I mean, uh, internet is, you know. You can look at local news, you can look at national news, all that. I'm going to take just sort of a different uh, tact on that. I think whatever is most effective is whatever you are watching or reading. It's effective to you if you're seeing it and you're getting news and information here. Something that you're not watching and reading isn't effective to you. Um, so I think the answer is individual for every individual person. Um, I think you're the, for you as a person to be the most well-rounded and knowledgeable and to be able to make the best decisions about the community in which you live and, and the life that you want to lead, you probably need to look to more than one media because as people before me have said, there are different strengths and weaknesses among us all. Um, but I think what's effective is, is what, where you get your information. Well, I would agree, first of all, that the internet is, is probably the most uh, Certainly the most influential, not necessarily the most effective. You can get to the, the widest range there. You can get the in-depth analysis. If you want to go to, uh, you know, something like Salon or the New York Times website, you can get the quick hits. You can get the um, things like the Onion, satire. You can get pretty much anything you want, uh, and it's up to you how you use it. Um, I do think that each medium has uh, extraordinary potential and. and different benefits. Um, I, I, with all due respect, I have a big problem with the way a lot of television news is, is handled nowadays. It's, it's many of the stations wall to wall crime and, and nothing else. And I think that's a great disservice to our culture. Um, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, with the exception of WHO. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add that. Exactly, the Republican ticket. But we have a news department, so. That's different. I, I just, you know, I hear that argument a lot. And, and while I agree with you, Tom, in, in the sense of uh, sometimes it is always wall to wall crime, I think people have an expectation of television that, um, that it was never designed to meet. Because television news is a headline service. That's what it's designed for, it's to tell you, like you said, the who, what, when, where. Um, and it's picture driven. So while that city council meeting, where they're making the decision about whether to tear down, you know, and start building in Norfolk, is, as an example, is a critical, critical story, it's horrible television. And every day, as you're sitting in the newsroom with Neon News, when you're going through the budget meeting, and when you're trying to decide what stories are being assigned, and so forth, 
many, many times we said, you know what, that's a newspaper store. Yeah. And we didn't have any problems giving it to the newspaper because if it doesn't have pictures, you're not going to watch. And quite frankly, beyond the journalistic value of what we do, it's a business. And anybody who tells you it's not a business is just telling you a bold face lie. It's a business and it has to make money. And the way TV makes money is through commercials. And the way that the commercials happen is if your eyeballs are watching my station. So, so there's a reality there that, you know, while I think a lot of it was easy to say, you know, well, TV news, all they do is crime. Which, you know, sometimes they do do too much. I agree with that. But I just want people to really think about, you know, what is the purpose of it? And how does it all fit in together? And we're not ignoring that council meeting. But what we're saying basically is, you know what, if you really want to know about that, here's another medium that can do it better. But they can't do the immediate pictures of that bridge falling in Minnesota and the, you know, the aftermath of that. The newspaper can't tell you that until the next day. So there's a balance there that I think people will need to pay attention to. And I think TV sometimes gets bad rap because it's, a, it's the easiest medium and it's the most accessible medium and it's the most immediate medium, but it's um, but there's an expectation there. I think it's a lot of rules. I want to give another medium a bad rap. Some people mention the internet, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, the internet is a medium. There's a lot of stuff on the internet. The problem with the internet is there's a lot of stuff on the internet, and, and there's not really good branding to differentiate. Oh, this is reliable, you know, and this is not. You know, anybody can say, oh, you know, I'm on the internet and I'm doing a newspaper. Well, you know, you might not know anything. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to, to, to look for brands, I mean, and most of those brands are brands that are going to come out of the traditional print or broadcast media. And the truth is, even for those of us who are a brand and who hopefully know what we're doing on the internet, um, you know, the, the, the race on the internet is to get it out there a minute ago, um, even faster than you can get it on TV, which means we're more likely to make mistakes there. We don't like to admit that because we figure, well, we can go back and fix it later and we see it and that page will go away. But, you know, even, even among established media, you know, there, there's, there's, there's problems there. Okay, we've got a whole work. Okay. Well, I'm kind of led to a question that I'm, I'm going to select from one of these two. How are you assigned an article and are you ever assigned an article and what do you do if you don't have any interest in it? Anybody wants to? Uh, okay, are there J school students here? Because they're not going to this in J school. Every day of your life, you're going to be assigned an article you don't care about because that's your job, you know, and you're not supposed to be interested in everything in your job, you know, nobody's interested in everything in their job. Um, so, you know, you use your skills and you, and you do the best you can. How stories are assigned depends a lot on the organization. I mean, some places are more editor driven, some places are more reporter driven. I've always found it best to come up with my own story ideas because that limits the number of things I don't want to do that I have to do. <laughs> and if I've found that if I'm doing something that, I want, that I'm interested in and that I've told my boss about it, he's interested in, he wants, then he's got to give me something else. So I, I, it's, it's self-preservation. Yeah. In television, there's a, a meeting every morning um, where basically the, the day's events, the known events are listed. Then the reporters come in and also pitch story ideas from their, either from their communities or from the, the um, beats that they have and so forth. And they make those pitches. Um, and then there's always breaking news, which means you get pulled off from one story and put onto whatever the breaking news is. So the, the whole goal in the morning is to try to budget out um, what story is going to be covered, how much time those stories will get. Um, and if there's something that you really, a reporter really, really doesn't want to do, most of the time they get stuck with it anyway. Because <laughs> there is nobody else. <laughs> when I was uh, at Wavy, I actually covered the whole peninsula. So I would try it, I would make sure I could find a story on the peninsula where they would, you know, drag me, you know, <laughs> south. Uh, and, and, it all, and it always wasn't the stories that they found interesting. It's the ones I, the, I found the stories interesting and they didn't. You know, call it. And the good thing is, I, I wasn't face to face in the meeting. I was always on the phone, so I could just put them on the speaker and just kind of wander off and do whatever. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, it's just the idea is that you really should come with your own story. You know, it's like you, you get out of the community. It's better because I've lived here since '90, so I know, I know a lot of people. So they they see you on TV. They 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 tend to give you the story more. And that's the more interesting stories. And the, but the more you come up with your own stories, the more they love you. 
because that's just one less thing. Because there's so much going on in the newsroom, that's just one less thing they have to worry about. And, and, and if you're a reporter that's reliable, then they know they can just let you run with the story and not really, you know, worry about it. But, you know, stories are a sign sometimes. And, you know, the ones that are a sign. The longer you do it, the less you have to do stuff you don't want to do. Because the more you know how to generate your own stuff. When you first start out, you've got to go to every high school graduation and, you know. You'll be doing the frog fest. Hey, every, 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 every giant pumpkin. Right. Well, the, other, the other truth is that, for the most part, editors spend most of their eight hours or ten hour day, however long it is, in the office. And for the most part, reporters should be spending their, their day out in the community or out in the field or talking to the people that they usually talk to. And any story that's dreamed up in an office is never going to be as good as a story that somebody comes up with by serving something or talking to people in, in the area in which they cover. It was a lot more helpful before we all got cell phone stuff, because then they couldn't get to you. <laughs> I think one of the, the problems now with stories being assigned, and this is just my take, is that a lot of times in the meetings you'll hear people say, well, I'd be interested to know. Well, who cares what you're interested in? <laughs> you should care about the general public. We should care about what you want to see, and not what we're interested in seeing, it's personally. And I think that drives a lot of some newsroom stories. That, that that's the stories they want to see. Well, it, it, TV in this area, to be honest with you, Virginia Beach rules. Well, if it happens in Virginia Beach, it supersedes everything else because that's where all the meters are. The meters are what measures who watches TV. I, I remember working on the weekends. God, what do we do? And the whole saying is, I mean, if you're a cat lover, I'm sorry. They're like, go down to Virginia Beach and swing a dead cat and see what you get. You know, it, it was. Go see what story you can come up with. Just go to Virginia Beach, the beach itself. You know, Virginia Beach was, is king. And so that, you know, that their story, you know, their idea of a good story was in Virginia Beach. It's also important to remember that what may appear to be a boring story uh, can be a fascinating story if you're a good enough writer. That's one of my favorite pieces is by Susan Orlean. It's, uh, it was written for Esquire. It's, uh, Portrait of the American Man at 10. She did it for a profile of a 10-year-old boy who lived in suburban New Jersey. Sounds pretty dull, right? It's fascinating. I rec highly recommend you go out and get it. Uh, and it's in a collection called Bullfighter Checks for Makeup. And um, she just she spent so much time with this kid. She just got inside his life and, and uh, painted the nuances of it and really made you understand what this kid's life was all about. It was fascinating. Is that kind of the same thing, Bill, for you? I know you're in the smaller venue, so maybe you don't have as much breaking news. I mean, being in Gloucester. My daughter lives in Gloucester. So in, in their market, the Gazette Journal is covering two counties, Gloucester, which is a county of maybe 37,000 people, and the sister county of Matthews, which is about 94, 9,500. And in terms of business and employment, Gloucester must have eight, perhaps 10 times the business community that Matthews does. The ownership of the publication is based in Matthews. So therefore, although Gloucester is a much bigger county, there are times that Matthews gets a lot more to play than it should within our own publication. And if I could uh, continue just for a sec, our stories on a weekly paper are similar to Daily or some of the other media. Uh, some of them are assigned, and some of them are staff generated. And yes, it's important for reporters to get out in the community, as others were saying, and to get out every day. Because of our smaller staff on weekly, there are times that I, I may not get out for an assignment for two days straight. That doesn't happen that often because I like to get out. It's so it's sheer volume that the small number of reporters deal with. There are times that we're in the office, making the phones, doing phone interviews, and doing background on stories we're working on. We may not get out to see people as much as we'd like. We're out plenty at, at meetings all the time at special events, but we cannot always be out there as we'd like to. It's just not the staff, it's not the resource that a larger staff might have. I think I can trust you all back to the next question. <laughs> I was I found it a fascinating one. Uh, what was the wildest thing you've ever done 
to get a story or an interview. <laughs> Do you haven't got anything you want? I don't know if mine is wild exactly, but I, um, I I like doing participatory journalism like George Clinton used to do. And uh, I decided I was fascinated by the martial arts, so I decided I was going to do it and um, and write about it. It was a profile of this this uh, guy, retired Army Ranger Colonel, who started this karate school. So it's part profile, part um, personal experience, part history of the martial arts, and um, I ended up getting hooked. And <laughs> that was two years ago, I have my brown belt now. All right. <laughs> so, 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 when I was at Lynchburg, the uh, city passed an ordinance that you couldn't smoke in restaurants anymore. Looking out into the newsroom, I was telling you how things have changed. I was the only one who smoked. So they sent me out basically to smoke in restaurants where I wasn't supposed to smoke to see if anybody would tell me not to. And the, the upshot of the story was no, nobody did tell me not to. And I was the only one smoking because I guess most smokers were more polite than I was because I've been assigned to be rude. I think I can upstage you a little bit. This was, uh, on the end, uh, he mentioned that he did it. Well, I did it in a different fashion. Um, I was working at the time for the Journal Guide, which is an African-American weekly newspaper in Norfolk. I was one of the only white writers that this staff has ever had. It was a job, and it was a very special job. It just happened to be that part of my week, I was working normal assignments like school board, and part of the week you happened to be talking to with black groups and other black leaders about the black community. And one day I was assigned to cover a talk at Norfolk State University, close to where the newspaper's located. And I go there, and it was a uh, black astronaut was speaking. And that was fine. It was a rather perfunctory talk, nothing special. And he had a few minutes for the media. He had a couple of TV cameras to set up, a couple of the Daily Reporter, myself, uh, perhaps uh, a couple other media were there. And, you know, he just said, thank you, you left the room. And then we said, thank you, we all got left. And, well, a couple of minute or two later, well, I had to go to the bank. Well, sort of, seemed like he had to go to the bathroom too. So I took the opportunity while we were going to the toilet to fill a couple of questions about minority hiring <laughs> or lack of all the astronaut program at that time, which was more than 20 years ago. And so I had some fresh stuff that went into the weekly paper that none of the other reporters had when I went to that night. And so these couple of questions I fired off were a heck of a lot better than some of the ones they got off because they didn't have the opportunity to have to think of that. They were the closed session as it be. But that did happen. <laughs> All right, I started my, uh, my TV career in Augusta, Georgia. I was in the Navy for a long time. And uh, there were some, uh, some shady businesses going on, some, uh, some massage parlors. <laughs> And uh, so we had these backpack uh, cameras. We had a little camera in the, you know, you carry your backpack. And, uh, and we're seeing if this stuff really happened. You know, stuff happens. You know, we just got to see if this stuff happens. And uh, so I go, we park in the Kmart, and I walk across the street. And uh, I go up to the, to the place, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? I didn't, I didn't have a dollar in my pocket anymore. <laughs> and I said, what's going on? She's like, hey, you know, da 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 And they took me in, I, I got nervous by then. I was like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, they took me in the room, actually, and, and I was like, look, you know, I, I, I gotta go. You know, because the stuff was gonna go, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to say that what they said was happening was gonna happen. <laughs> and I walked out, and and we uh, ran back to the truck and looked in the, the video and the camera stopped. Oh. So I went through all that work. So we had the audio, the audio. And I went back in and I tried to talk. And they had these little windows and they didn't want to talk to us. But I, you know, I, I, I went in there and it was like being closed in. You know, because they just, they were like, they came out of nowhere. It's like four women. <laughs> And then one more, I have to say, last year I played, I'm, what, 39, and I went out and I said, I wonder how it feels to play football in college still. And I went out and played football at, at HU for two days. Oh, and I'm telling you, I mean, these guys are big and strong and fast. And I was running with the line who weighed about 300 pounds, and they were still way ahead of me. I was wheezing. And, <laughs> but I, you know, I did it for the story. You know, I went out there and got knocked on my can. You know, but, you know people, people like that kind of stuff. 
That was, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never top that, but uh, yeah. mine was, I've had a bunch of different ones, but the one that I'm thinking about right now is when um, I was actually in college, I think I was a, I was a sophomore or junior, and I was working for the college paper, and we got wind that there was going to be a sit-in at the radio station, because the radio station, which was campus owned, was changing its format, and it was seen as a racial issue, um, because of the type of music it had been playing and the type of music they were switching to. So we, somebody had called the paper, and I was there, so I grabbed my notebook and ran right over there and actually got locked into the sit-in. Ended up there for um, more than a day. I couldn't get out. <laughs> and we ended up having to break out through the back. They ended up having to break open a wall behind the radio station to get us all out. Um, and then the sit-in went on for about three or four days after that. And then I was able to actually, it's very hard to cover it from the inside because I couldn't get the word out. This was before cell phones, believe it or not. <laughs> um, so I couldn't tell anybody what was going on, but they're taking all these notes for, you know, they had. Um, but then I was able to come back at it and actually cover it from a different perspective after I was released. <laughs> well, I worked for Black Entertainment Television for um, a year back in the mid-80s when it was um, first started. And um, we did a talk show called On the Line With, and Louis Farrakhan was in Washington uh, doing a speech. And I went to the mosque and um, was searched, strip searched. Um, and then brought before the minister and convinced him to come on the show. And I don't have time to tell you the whole thing, but it was a very, very interesting um, experience. <laughs> but he did do the talk show. Well, that's the one step. Let's try something to get a little more serious, if you don't mind. Um, what about, do you believe, and anybody can just pop in here, do you believe that as a journalist, your source of information should be protected no matter what the circumstance? No. Your source of information should be protected as long as it's a it's a credible, real source that tells you the truth. I've had like people who want to be um, confidential sources who were lying. So I mean, in that case, no. And I think you have to make them a promise. If you made a promise up front and said, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody who you are, then I think you have to uphold that promise. My promise is contingent on the fact that you're talking, sure. Sure, I mean, I'm, taking, I'm just taking that one step forward. I mean, if, if, even if somebody tells the truth that they've made no promise, if there's no promise at the time, then no. But, you know, the truth, we very rarely, very rarely, I've worked at the Daily Press for more, for more than 15 years now. I think I've maybe only once written a story in which I did not name a source. Um, we try really hard not to do that. Right. Yeah. And now sometimes people would come to me when I was um, reporting, I was the shipyard reporter for four or five years before. Um, and I had people who would come to me and tell me stuff on the side, and I would then go use that information to go get official people to confirm it. Right. And I didn't name that person, but they were actually never part of my story other than the fact that they basically gave me a tip. Um, so it's, it's real rare that you'd even be in this sort of thing. Right. Well, and I had a similar circumstances just recently where I wrote a story based on about a political candidate who had some driving issues in his past, which I found out about because somebody sent me um, documents, court documents. So the source of the story was really the court documents, but we didn't identify who had sent them to us. <coughs> Sometimes when we go to crime stories, which unfortunately were a lot, you know, somebody would, you know, people see things that they they wish they hadn't. And a lot of times they were willing to talk to us, but for me, I wouldn't interview them right near where it was because everybody where it was knew who they were. So, you know, I would, I would just kind of talk to them and, and not act like I was interested and have them meet me somewhere. Because it was it was actually, you know, they put their, put their lives in, you know, in jeopardy, you know, because they were basic, they didn't want to go to the police, but they would tell us. And then the, they now would force the police to go try to find this person, whatever, said them, you know, but we would never, you know, protect their identity because if somebody saw that, then their life would be, some TV stations don't you know, kind so of you honor, do, honor that. So did you do the blurred out face thing on No, we, yeah, we, yeah, we, just, we wouldn't even do it standing from the back either because whatever piece of clothes they have, I'm like, and everybody knows everybody. So I think a lot of times what you can do though is just write their piece, rather than have them actually say it, right. you write it into your script. Right. That's how you can write well, it. the problem that the TV reporter says, the TV reporter, if it's raining, the TV reporter has to have an interesting in the rain, so you believe that it's raining. <laughs> Yeah, but, but, but there's still, 
um, script that has to be written because right. the people on the interviews don't tell the whole story. Well, it's, it's not great. Yeah, you can write it. It's not great. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, you can say we're trying to protect their identity. Yeah. You know, and this is what they said. You know, blah 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 blah. You know, because not everybody, contrary to popular belief, not everybody wants to be on TV. You know, they would ask, why do you want to get the book? No teeth or whatever. Those are the people. <laughs> Those people that are on TV. Yeah, they're the ones who run up, and a lot, unfortunately, they're the ones who have a lot of information. But you still try to protect them too. You know, it's just like, you know, I, I did a story where a, a woman's ten-year-old son had been sexually molested, and she was ready to bring him out and show us, you know, bring him out. But you have to protect people from themselves. From themselves. You, know, yeah. you don't want a ten-year-old kid. You know, and your class and kids are pretty cool. You know, your class and kids are pretty cool. You know, can't so you always protect. get the information of, of the identity. Uh, I cover a lot of governmental meetings, and sometimes we have public hearings that may go along for two hours or longer. And my notebook, I'm sure, like some of the other reporters here, at notebooks get rather voluminous with notes and lots of names. Uh, some of the folks kind of go up to, the, some of the ones are regulars at these meetings and you know them and you know, you, you know their voices. Other people you've never seen before, they kind of go up and mumble with the mic and you sort of say, please sign up, they don't. So what happens to some of these uh, multi-speaker forums? My notebook is, well, a, a hodgepodge of notes. I can make out very well the every person but this is worse than doctors. I've got all these little notations like guy with afro, lady with frosted hair. I don't know who these people are. And then I'll attempt if they have a water break sometime during this meeting to uh, try to look through the crowd as it's leaving after they've spoken. Uh, which unfortunately there's four guys with afros, six ladies with frosted hair. I'm trying my best to find the one to match up. The style of their publication if it really is a Jermaine Collins said in a public forum, occasionally we can use it like one woman said, yeah. because it was clearly said at a public forum, we could not ascertain her name, nor we usually try to check with the county. Recording secretaries, the official transcript, they don't always get their names. And again, we would like to, we, once we have the information, we try to use it in a respectful way. I've never been in my long career put in a position of having to protect the source at the threat of going to jail, and frankly, if it got to that, because I have a wife, a son, and a family responsibilities, I don't know if I could go to jail and protect his source, but that's a totally different issue from writing about people that you know, are not named. That's more than movies, right? Okay. Uh, I'd like to go to a national, serious question. I really appreciate all these questions that journalism students had. How is the embedding of journalists with the military in Iraq affected what we read and see. I know most of us are local. Can I have that one first? Um, it's, it's, it's made what we read and see not as, as informative, and as analytical, and as factual as it should be, and that's the very reason they were embedded. Um, in other wars, in the first Iraq war, in the Vietnam War, the press went out on its own and looked for stories. What the press of Iraq now sees is what the military wants them to see. They're taking where the military wants them to go, or the State Department. Um, so the press is not operating on their own. They're basically operating as a voice of the U.S. government from Iraq. I tell you this, as a, uh, I'm a public affairs officer in the, in the Navy, reserves as a lieutenant. And it, me, myself, I don't, I don't, if the, 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 the media wants to go over, you know, and I'm in the media as well, if the media wants to go over and cover it, then they should be they should be allowed to do so. That you have to get your own security and do all that. That's just my take because you know I mean I I, I I strongly believe you have a right to see what's going on, but not at the expense of you know soldiers putting their lives on the line, not fighting or protecting you know Katie Curry or whatever. I, I I just don't agree with it. You know so I, I just have a basic problem with whether you're over there or not. The lack of questioning about what's going on. I just don't, I, I was very disappointed in my profession in terms of the coverage of this war because we're not asking the right questions. Not we're just not asking any questions. 
I mean, but, but we're just we're leading up to the we're leading up to it. Not do we let a lot of stuff just go by the wayside. And I think that in the Vietnam War and in other wars, there was a lot more questioning about what's happening here. And I don't think that we really stepped up to the plate this time. And you know, and I think that's a problem. And I'm I'm hoping that that journalists, younger journalists. We all talk about our years of experience up here, but as, as people come behind us, that they don't lose that natural curiosity that makes you want to be a journalist to begin with. You become a journalist because you want to know what's going on, because you want to tell a good story, um, but because in, but you want to also dig behind it and find out what is the story to be told. And I just think that that um, the embedding that I just think the whole thing has just been fun. And I hate that word, <laughs> but I really do, in this instance, think that we allowed it to happen because we did not ask the right questions. The problem with being embedded is, I mean, the individual journalists over there, I, I believe what a lot of them want to do a good job, many of them are providing uh, bits and pieces of good information, but um, eventually, you know, they get close to the people they're with, and so I, I think it's analogous to the Washington Press Corps, uh, which I think <coughs> does a mediocre to, to bad job because they begin to enjoy being part of the club and they report it from that perspective rather than from a critical distance. I mean, you gotta remember, journalists are human. I mean, we're, we build relationships. Part of your job is to build relationships so that you can get information. But in building those relationships, you become friends or you become acquaint, acquainted with those people. And, and so there's a real fine line that you have to walk um, in, in terms most cases, of you have to live there. You know, I, I mean, I found that, I actually live in Richmond now and work in one square. It's the first time I've ever like, lived somewhere different than where I work. And I found it's very free. You know, I don't care if it moves to somebody else's election. It doesn't affect me at all. So I'll report whatever I want. We're reporting that you know. Okay. Uh, let's uh, go to another one local, and if you don't mind, kind of the same. We talked about some of the questions beforehand. Uh, what, who do you think are the most influential players in the Hampton Roads and why? I think Michael Vick is right now. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, 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 a, it's a local story and it's a national story. I mean, I, I mean have rel- how many people have relatives that have no idea where certain parts of Virginia are? They know where Surrey County is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that it has people, what, I mean, unfortunately it brought a lot of attention to Hampton Roads right now. And, you know, however you feel about the story. I think right now, he, he's the most influential person on, on a national stage. You know, if you want to look nationally, I think that he has brought recognition to this area, you know. So. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I really understand the question, but uh, if, if it's influential people from him, some from Hampton Roads is about to well, is somewhat influential now and might be very much more so in the next couple of years would be Bob McDonald from Jim Beach, the Attorney General, who had to be a candidate for governor in 2009. Yeah, the tendency is to go right, but the power brokers, uh, you know, Randy Forbes or, uh, you know, I think Paul Frank, you know, at least on the south side, wields an enormous amount of influence. Um, but lately I've been fascinated by, by his especially on the cultural side, this grassroots, uh, these underground artists that I'm meeting, and all kinds of people that you really don't, um, their, their influence isn't evident on the surface, but it will be um, over time. And uh, those are the stories that I'm interested in. Um, these people who are, um, you know, maybe 23 year old hip hop artists or whatever, you, you've never even heard of yet, but uh, they're, gonna, they're gonna have an enormous influence on their peers and then eventually beyond is going to be mainstream. One that comes to mind for me is Mr. Frank, like you said, because he's stepped up to the plate for regional economic development. And he's well outside of the area that the weekly paper Barnard covered. Another even closer here to the peninsula that comes to mind is Walter Sigaloff. Sigaloff is the founding force of an achievable three a very successful combination of academics and tennis and other sports programs to uh, you know, uplift people that might not have the benefit of otherwise being uplifted and you know, having some advantages in life. And 
he's one who comes to mind and uh, he did well in business from what I understand his background. He's now choosing to give back, but he's chosen to give back for a number of years now. Yes, I think sometimes you have to look beyond the, the elected officials to, I mean, there are a lot of people, I think, in our community that, that I've written about who are just doing good things for people around them. Um, I'll mention a woman I wrote about, I guess it was just a couple weeks ago, her name's Donna Atkins. She's the um, local advocate for the head of the American Cancer Society. She's doing fabulous things. She has 500 phone numbers plugged into her cell phone. Um, wow. Because when somebody she knows, when she hears somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else who has cancer, she gets on the phone to that person and finds out what they need. Do they need food? Do they need transportation? I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are like her, who are doing, who are under the radar, who aren't appearing in the newspaper, um, and yet they're affecting and, and um, improving the lives of, of a lot of our, our, our friends and neighbors. As a matter of fact, your picture had a uh, former employee here, Louise Bowler, who was with her. Yes. And so she's actually a great person. Well. And, and there's a lot of other people like her. I hold her up because I, she's top of mind because I spoke to her in the last couple of days. Um, and I, I, I know actually personally that her um, her, her mentor, when I interviewed her, and I didn't because my article was showing Davis, so that it's very timely for me at the moment. But there's a lot of people like her or her who are, you know, not employed any place, not elected any place, but they're doing a lot that you don't even know about here. Uh, what do you think, so we have a lot of journalism majors and I think there are going to be people in that group. Uh, what do you think was the most challenging and or rewarding aspect of your jobs? Um, I'll say, you know, believe it or not, I'm generally a shy person. <laughs> <laughs> so to walk up to somebody and say, hey, I want to ask you about how your mom died. You know, or you know, whatever your story's going to be about. I mean, sometimes you have to walk up to people and and you don't approach it that way. You start, you know, you probably get to answer on the edges when you go to talk to people, but eventually you know where you're going. You know, when I'm talking to, you know, I'll go back to Donna Atkins because I just mentioned her. You know, I had to ask her about her father's death, her mother's death, the death of people she was familiar with, she was very tight with at work, her own experiences with cancer, her own fears about getting breast cancer, about um, having other cancers, being unable to have her own children, having to adopt a fourth child. Um, I mean, how, how do you start that conversation? And I think that's sometimes the hardest thing that I do is pick up the phone, walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, please talk to me. Open up to me with some of the, the most trying and most celebrated parts of your life. Some strange you know Probably as the news director, um, responsible for the whole newsroom, having a newscast that I felt was really balanced to me, a really great news day was when all three of the major stations were forward uh, um, had a different lead story. Because to me, that indicated that everybody was out doing their thing. And they were really trying to find stories. And they weren't, you know, we weren't all running to the same meeting or, or whatever. So that was the biggest challenge and the biggest reward for me um, was it would, would be at the end of the day that I look at our newscast, how did it stack up against the other newscast, and were we all really covering Hampton Roads as opposed to just all going to the same store? I think it, for me the, most, the challenging part was the, the, uh, the emotional roller coaster that the television news put you on. You know, it, it wasn't uncommon five days in a row to do someone being killed. You know, and I think it was, you know, one of the toughest ones was covering a four-year-old little boy who had been beaten to death by, you know, a grown man. You know, when you have kids yourself and you have to deal with that, you know, you see it and you kind of, you know, it, it's almost like you see death almost as much as a funeral. You know, because you see it so much, but then, in turn, like Monday, you know, Monday you may do a good, you know, happy story, Tuesday happy, then Wednesday through Friday, there's a fire in Newport News where, you know, where the, 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 the 300 pound lady couldn't get out of her house, she was on the second floor, they couldn't get her out. You know, how, it, it, dealing with that was, was just, it was just so challenging. And to come home and not let it affect what you were doing, but it, 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 you know, and then my problem was like, I'm a hot head on the road. So. You know, you know, you're already stressed from that story, then you get behind some guys going like 10 miles per hour. In the left lane. And so it got, it got to the point, you know, where it, it just got, is it, is it worth it anymore? You know, but, and, and then you said rewarding aspects, the rewarding aspects, you, you know, everywhere you go, you know, TV was a different meaning because every day, 
300,000 people watched it. Or, or whatever. So that means 300,000 people watched it. And the rewarding part was having someone come up and say, oh, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Not the fact that I see you on TV, it's you're doing a great job. I like your story. Because to me, that let us know that you, you, you watch Waving, but too, you liked my individual story. And I may have thought it was you know, garbage. Or, or, you know, I didn't do a very good job. People would come up and say, I like your story. I mean, and then TV, though. I mean, that, that was a lot of benefits of me. You know, on, on you know I mean, there was, there was a lot of, you know, when you get free clothes, you get free whatever, you know. And so a lot of stuff was given to you, but but you had to try to balance that with. La, 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 la. <laughs> we just seen, just seen the bad part, the bad side of life. You saw every aspect of life, the good side, the bad side. And a lot of stuff that we would deal with, it wouldn't even, you know, make here. So I just if I could pick back on what Nair was saying. Also, the one of the challenges of being a journalist, a good journalist, is to try not to become jaded. Um, when I was working in Philadelphia, um, there was a call. I, I was running the assignment desk, and there was a call over the police radio for a ten-year-old who was in shock, sitting on his front porch in a drive by. And I'm get a crew out there. We gotta go cover this. And the assignment editor, who had been there for a hundred years, goes. That happens in that neighborhood all the time. And to me, that is inexcusable. There is no 10-year-old in this country who should not be able to sit on their front porch and enjoy a summer day. But, but so, no matter how much you try, you do get jaded. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. I, I was covering a course in, in crime in Lynchburg when crack first came. Every crack rest, rest, that was a story, you know, uh, oh, the, we got to go out, the TV people would be there too. When was the last time you saw a TV story about crack arrest? Well, that is or a news story. story. You don't see it. It, it, it. it doesn't even make a blog. It might make a blog. Well, I mean, I guess, too, the challenge was, too, to always hear the smart comments from people. You know, a kid was killed down 22nd Street. No, it was crack. You know, it was always the comments, you know. Everything in, in downtown Newport News was about drugs, but everything in, say, Williamsburg, oh, there had to be something wrong. Right. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. you know, they, you know it, it was dealing with different perceptions. And a lot of times, perceptions Become find reality. their way into the, the newscast, and it, and it the news is slanted. I mean, you have to look beyond, that's what they were saying the challenge is, looking beyond the story and finding the story. You know, you go to a crime scene, the guy's laying out there, he's been shot, but look around. You know, see the barbed wire on the apartment complex, and you see the little kid in the window. He's trapped in his own house. Right. That's the story. You know, the, the guy laying here, you know, dead is the story because it's. But look at the, the young kid who has to look at it, and he can't get his mom to let him go outside and play. So he's stuck inside, maybe playing video games. So that may lead to, you know, SOL test. You know, just different, different things. But the story is, if you look around, you know, you, you have to. Just take what's on the surface. Yeah, you have to be able to. And it comes with years of being in, in the business. And, and, and you have to have compassion, too, you know. A lot of times you don't go to stories where, I mean, you can, your eyes are going to well up. I mean, trust me. They're, you're going to be looking pretty funny sitting there. You're going to be, you know, looking worse than the people you're interviewing. But you're going to have to have people cry on your shoulder. People, you know, it, it's, you know, you have to interview people with Down syndrome and stuff, you know. You just said it, it's a compassion thing. But at the end of the day, it's fulfilling to deal with, with people like that, knowing that you had that compassion and that you helped them out. And, you know, next time they have a, a story idea, you know, they're willing to, to come to you. It seemed like in TV, you had less leeway to be not compassionate because, you know, they see you every day. They feel like they know you because you come into their house. In any other way, if you come across as being a nice guy, any other way, and, you know, you, you're done. One person just needs to call the station on you, and that's it. I mean, I don't care if 50,000 people call and say, you know, you did a great job. One person called and said, I saw that guy out in the jerk. I'd like to pick up on the first part of what you said about getting the story, the, the story that's not so obvious. There's a tendency, I think, in um, really in all the media to, um, to rely on formulas and uh, you know, the typical formula of a, any controversial stories, you get one person from one side, you know, maybe it's an official in the city, you get a, a critic, you know, let's say it's a story in Norfolk, a controversy over the demolition of historic buildings, you get the city councils 
on one side and you get the start for the question, folks. And you report what one side A says and then B, and you're done. And uh, there's, there's it, given the fact that we're on deadlines and, and we got to turn out a lot of stories, it's hard to avoid that sometimes. But you, what you really need to do is try to penetrate deeper and, and find um, the bigger picture. You know, maybe maybe that story is related to the story that was reported three months ago. They don't seem related. Now you really need um, work at it, you can connect the dots and, and um, give people a level of understanding that they're not going to uh, otherwise have by just reporting those individual stories. For me, the, I'm not sure the challenge, that's the challenge. I'm not sure that's necessarily the biggest reward. I'm finding more and more the biggest reward for me is nurturing young writers. Um, if I find somebody who's really talented but you know, inexperienced, um, it's a great pleasure to work with them and, and try to help them uh, on their craft and, uh, and see them do it. That's a huge reward. On the other hand, early in my career, back in the office on the weekly there, you know, as a reporter, I had uh, about six years or so experience at that time, five or six. Uh, I was a little put out because one of the other reporters, a friend of an owner's family, is an employee, shows up with a master's degree, which was well and good, but for at least six months, if not a year, she was a total liability. She did not have a clue as what to do. So myself and the other reporters on the small staff were having to make up her shortfalls because she, yes, yeah, she had a paper degree, but she had not taken the initiative to have internships to have had part-time paid jobs, even part-time jobs unpaid to get some experience. And here she heard the whole staff in trying to learn, and it's good that she eventually became a good reporter, but it's only because myself and the others suffered because of her, and we shouldn't have had to go through that. But that was a management decision. They did not consult myself and the rest of the staff on her part. And uh, these things do happen. And another thing, if I could just tie in over the earlier comments uh, about Martin Lee Island, the police and witnessing some of the bloodshed, I think one of the best things that happened to me in my long reporting career was that I got to witness, I was covering police being early in my career on a daily, several dead bodies. Seeing the bodies right off the bat, you know, I was about 25 at the time rather callous to me for the rest of my career. It made it a lot, a lot easier for these type of assignments. So later on, I've had assignments, including a couple in Gloucester that were rather gory, some traffic accidents. It really didn't phase me. I went, I took pictures, I did my job without really getting emotional about it because I had the uh, experience early in my career of just, this is what happens in life. Sorry, the person who's dead, I guess it would be different if the person who was dead or you know, shot was someone I knew, but luckily that's never been the case. I hate to think what it would be like if it was, the torment I might face. I don't know if any of the other panelists ever faced this with someone they knew, but I might luckily have not. And I don't know follow up with what you said about you get the one side, you get a statement from this side, you get a statement from that side. Do you think you have a story? I, I tell you what you're saying. We're supposed to be objective, and sometimes we think that objective is this side gets this much time and this side gets this much time, and that's a fair story. Our job is not to be fair to the two sides of the story. Our job is to be fair to facts. Right. And, and sometimes we forget that there aren't just two sides in the story. There's a right. lot of gradations in between and on either end. And, and just because you go out and talk to the two sides doesn't mean you cut the whole story. The two established sides. I want to ask a funny question next. But remember, I'm reading what somebody else wrote. Okay? <laughs> I think Hillary Clinton is just as good, if not better, than other candidates. Do you think that America is afraid to put a woman in the White House? It's too early to tell that. Although she's the front runner, there's something about uh, this brings up something about politics and. And something we talked about, we haven't talked about, but about her journalism. Everybody now reporting on politics and writing about politics is saying that Hillary is the front runner, and that whoever wins the early primaries, because the primaries have been moved up, and that's going to make the winner uh, determine faster. Well, 
You know, nobody knows that because this is the first year that they've actually been moved up. We've just all decided that that's the story. You know, if you can make an argument that exactly the opposite will happen, and in fact, probably will happen on the Republican side because nobody will get any momentum. People, people the primaries are going on, people win in 30 and 20 percent, might even go to the convention undecided. But we've all decided that that's the story, so that's the way it's being, being written, and you never hear the other side. Well, the danger that talk about making sure you read lots of different sources and so forth, because the danger is if you listen to just the, the mainstream in, in terms of what's being said now, then you, your attitude then becomes, well, I don't need to vote this point, because we've already decided we can front runner. That's the issue I have with policy, political coverage. Well, also, the, also coverage. the interesting thing is that as soon as she became the front runner, people started to turn on her, start to see some like really critical stories because. Uh, the press doesn't like really have a Democratic or Republican bias. We like a good fight. So if something looks like they're getting way out front, no, 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 come back. We haven't had to fight yet. Well, so I mean, I don't know the fact that she's a Democratic frontrunner right now it means a whole lot. I'm a lifelong Democrat, a lifelong Mets fan. There's one thing I've learned: that both <laughs> Democrats crash and burn. <laughs> so, well, and also at this point, at this point, four years ago, Howard Dean was the runaway, was the frontrunner. Yeah, that's true. I think it's so impossible to call anybody a front runner before a vote has ever been passed. Well, but, that, but that's part of the problem because, I mean, think about all the coverage that you've seen. What do they say? No, we couldn't. The front run. That's it. It's like one thing. It's because John decided that. It's because we've become that. obsessed with polling. But, yeah. And that's not totally our fault because politicians are more obsessed right. with polling. So and, and they also look at how who's raised more money and blah, 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 blah. But I don't think that you can even really necessarily say that any one person is. Square and, and, and clear. I mean, yeah. I think it would be great if every new organization here would just agree that we'll never run another poll. Because <laughs> it's not really our job to tell you what you think. It's our job to tell you what's going on and then you, you think. think. Right. What the panel has not mentioned here is the Bill Clinton factor. <laughs> the Bill, Bill Clinton, by not running, could be totally swaying the election. People are saying, yeah, I'm going to vote for Hillary. Knowing deep inside, there's no way we're really going to vote for her because of the baggage with the husband. It's embarrassing to us in our religious faith. The uh, traditional family values words that are always must around election time. So some of these folks that are voting for Hillary are just saying they aren't, probably really aren't. And it really will be interesting when it's all said and done. Is the bill factor really going to be a big factor? It'll be no factor at all. If that's true, I hope it is. And I would encourage anybody out here, if you were to ever fall by a poster, just lie. Lie. <laughs> Tell me exactly the opposite of what you're going to do. Lie to me. Well, let's go to a little less controversy and lie. Um, I believe everything I read and hear in the media, so we just kind of discourage me. Uh, what is the most interesting story that you've ever covered? Everybody should have one of those. Okay. Okay. Um, I was thinking about that because we got the questions here a few minutes before we started. I've had a number of very good stories, a number of interesting ones. If you can only tell about one, I think the most meaningful one to me was interviewing the actor Burt Reynolds. He was at the time filming a movie in Savannah, Georgia. It was a one of these great B action movies called Gator. And part of it was filmed in Savannah parts and other parts of the South. And uh, you know, they had uh, you know, a mixed uh, cast, some people that you knew, um, and other people were unknowns, including the mayor of Savannah, Georgia, and a Greek fellow played the uh, desk attendant at a motel for one of the shots. And I, I thought of it being the most interesting story. I covered a number of stories about the making of that movie when the crew was based in Savannah for a matter of weeks. But for a young reporter, sitting there in the trailer with Burt Reynolds, writing a little feature story about, about the making of a movie. And, and, and then we get a knock on the door from one of the assistants. Hey, uh, Mr. Reynolds, it's time for us to resume shooting for him to say the following. I'm talking to my friend. I'll be finished soon. Can you imagine what that felt like to a 25-year-old man? That someone I just met Reynolds a, a couple of times briefly before the sit-down interview, you know, earlier in the filming, 
And so I think that was probably the most interesting story and the interaction it had from somebody so famous that he would take the time. And actually, at the time the attendant knocked on the door, we were not really that much talking about purposes of the story. <coughs> he was schmoozing about playing football for Florida State. He was a very good halfback. So that was quite an interesting story for me to write, where it became a series of stories about it and the filming of that movie. Probably for me, covering the 1988 Democratic Convention, that was the year that Jesse Jackson ran. Um, I got to hear Ann Richards talk about Silver Spoon, uh, <laughs> Silver Foot, rather, in the mouth, and uh, Barbara Jordan spoke that year, um, just being on the floor and going through the whole convention process. As the producer, um, I was the only one out of my entire crew, there were five of us, who basically got no sleep the entire week that we were there because we were doing stories around the clock and when we got on the airplane to come home, um, we were sitting on the plane and I said, why is it taking us so long to take off? And we'd been in the air for 45 minutes. I literally had passed out <laughs> once it was over, but it was so invigorating to be able to cover the local story that I was working in Maryland at the time. Um, for WJC, so we were covering the Maryland delegation and what was going on um, there. It was fascinating. Um, I was at home the uh, 1996 U.S. Senate race between Chuck Robb and Oliver North, and just because Colonel North was such a fascinating character, um, it was hard to believe he was running for Senate. He, he, it's hard to describe, describe him, really. He's not quite a normal person. When you look at his eyes, <laughs> you don't get the feeling you get when you look at a normal person's eyes. One of the, I, I would say, three most fascinating people I've ever interviewed, along with the novelist Tom Clancy and uh, Andy Simmons and Kiss. Okay. <laughs> uh, the most interesting story I did uh, when I was in Augusta, we, we found out that the state didn't require, still doesn't require, home daycares to have liability insurance in order to have a license. And we found this out because we inter I interviewed the mother of a, of a he was 18 years old, and he was in a home daycare, and he fell into a mop bucket filled with water, bleach, ammonia. I mean, he's, and the kid was, he's permanently disabled right now. But the satisfaction with that, you know, the, the interesting thing was to find out that they didn't require that. And, the satisfaction was we, you know, that the state wouldn't <coughs> change the law or require daycares to have insurance. But we got it so that they made sure that daycares inform parents that they, they do or don't because they, they thought it would be too cost, you know, they would run too much. And the mother actually fought, North Virginia actually has the same laws too, so if you have kids at daycare, you need to check that. She fought and got the laws changed in Virginia that you have to, they have to tell, you know, parents. And now she's going national with the whole thing. But it, it was just interesting to cover the whole story to see that what kind, you know, that the laws were so raggedy that they wouldn't require daycare. To, you know, to, you know, it was interesting to see the daycares. You know, the, they pass a law like that, but then it comes to find out taxpayers you're putting the bill to take care of this kid because it's costing like a hundred and. $20,000 a year to keep him on respirators and, and nurses. So that, that was probably my more interesting stuff. You know, I've got, I've got a bunch. I'll touch on two real quick. One is real short. Um, I was working on Saturday, and you should never, you never want to be in the office on Saturday when the editor's in the office. <laughs> Somehow we heard that, that some guy had jumped off the James River Bridge, and I had to find out who this person was. And apparently he had jumped off because his dog had jumped over, and he jumped over to save his dog. Um, so that was kind of fun, hunting and pecking around the line with this guy. Couldn't find his phone number, and I'm going out to the neighborhood and knocking on the door, and, and as, as I tell them who I am, I can hear them swishing the beer cans off the table. <laughs> that was kind of fun, and I walked in like one of these. I, I took somebody with me, because if I go into a neighborhood that I'm not familiar with, I don't like to go by myself, and I won't let another reporter that I know is just walk into it but they, you know, I'll go with somebody just to go along. But I think the other, the more recent one is I've done, a, I've been following family recently, um, uh, mother, father, and two boys. Uh, I, I get into these stories where the, the people pull at my heartstrings, and it's a story about two brothers. Um, they both have a genetic disease um, that is fatal in all cases, usually by the time they turn about 12. 
um, the older boy was diagnosed, um, and as a result of his diagnosis, they tested his younger brother who had absolutely no symptoms and found out he had the same disease. As a result, the, the younger boy was able to get some experimental treatment that may save his life, and his older brother is going to die and is slowly dying now. And it's just, it, it, just to get into these people's stories and, and be able to tell a story about people. And then the reward from that is that um, a lot of people saw that story came out and helped him. For me, it was a story I didn't write it, but I was the editor. Uh, the story of Norfolk's so called shadow government. Um, it's a small group of very influential people, some elected officials, some not, who uh, basically decide, among other things, who's going to run for office when there's a vacancy. And uh, they pick somebody, and uh, but another fellow decided he wanted to run. They called him in for a meeting and said, uh, this is a quote, what makes you think you have the right to decide to decide? that's our decision? <laughs> and um, we got into this, and actually I was told about it at a Christmas party, so the lesson there is pay attention at all times. Right. I filed it away, and three months later we, we ran this story, uh, in-depth look at this so-called shadow government. Um, so within about an hour after our papers hit the streets, they disappeared from uh, all the racks in downtown in Ghent and other areas where we have high circulation and we had reports of you know, BMWs pulling up and you know <laughs> getting out of school and taking the paper. It was a lot of fun. So the next the next week I scrapped the story we had scheduled and rebrand the cover of the previous week's story <laughs> saying the story someone doesn't want you to read. And by then it was too late. That was the day before election day, so it was really too late for them to go around stealing papers again. And, and uh, they also we identified a lot of these cars, so people were kind of sweating bullets. And um, the upshot of this uh, is that the guy, the outsider, ended up winning the election. Um, I don't know how much we swayed it, but he credited us with it, so I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, that was far away the most interesting story because, uh, you know, it, it said a lot. I think the important thing was it wasn't about favoring one candidate or another. It was about favoring the open process of government. And what was interesting is the mayor and I subsequently had long conversations about this. And uh, for a long time, he didn't understand that. He thought it was about favoring one side or the other. And uh, um, for me, it was about the important point that the democratic process should be open to anybody who wants to participate. Thank you, everybody. I'd like to open questions if any of you have it in the audience. Anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, oh, okay, Ray. Yeah. I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for your service. I'm, uh, 100% disabled vet, uh, Army, 13 years. I just want to know, um, in the media, do you think that the overall conglomerate of the whole country, do you think it's more liberal than conservative? Can I ask you how you define media? Everything. So, everything radio, radio TV, ads. movies, I'm books. Everything coming at us. Everything. everything. Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think you can include the entertainment industry. It's likely, yeah. Can I ask you how you define liberal? Anything that isn't conservative. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, I, I always encourage people to go to the dictionary and look it up. If you look it up, it means open-minded. It means interested in education. It means generous. So, uh, you know, in that case, I think you'd have to look at the individuals practicing. Some of them are idiots. Some of them are, are liberal in the best sense of the word. Some of them are conservative. Uh, if you look at this market, you look at talk radio, it's wall to wall right wing. There's not a single liberal voice on the air. So, and again, I'm talking about. Well, I don't think they have a single liberal voice on the air. <laughs> okay. On Rush the bus. Oh, 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 yeah, Rush the bus. Now I'm not talking about. I'm talking about public. Now I'm not talking about public. Public. I'm talking about, public, public. <laughs> talking about class, classic talk radio. Not a single liberal to be found. You'd have to beat the bushes. Far but in far. contrast, there's sort of a left wing 
alternative media, which is the Colbert Report and uh, the Onion, and which you know is all satire, which is all, all obviously from the left, because I mean the left has a better sense of humor probably, but. <laughs> yeah, now just I mean, I, I mean they tried to have they tried to have that on Fox. The, the Fox and it was canceled because it wasn't Fox. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And lady, any um, Have you ever, in writing of a piece or going on a piece of journalism, ever had it canceled because someone who owned the company said you could not print it or publish it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did y'all have that question? Mm -hmm. Just asking, in essence, about censorship. If you've ever written a piece that couldn't be printed because someone in the company or someone in power said no. Come on, Kevin. Get away. Okay. Uh, this was when I was working for the Journal on Guy and Norfolk. So this is the early 1980s. Uh, there was a uh, major African-American rally, a big march, winding its way through the South. Went through Virginia, ended in Washington, D.C., with large mobilization there. In doing some reporting, you know, just uh, working the phones, uh, a few days before the event was to take place and to be current for our, our issue, one coming out right before the event, we had several other articles in the weeks prior. I stumbled upon the fact that it seems like the group, this large group of blacks, and there were some white supporters among them, but not a great deal. Uh, they didn't have any parade permits to camp in D.C. for their rally, for their staging, and no permits from Virginia to cross the bridge into D.C. Just some basic things they stumbled upon. So I wrote the story, a straight story, that organized with a black rally, or you know, maybe a possible violation this is in this rule. Well, the, the boss doesn't like it. She says, no, we can't run this. She takes me to the owner's office. She says, we can't run this. It's not favorable to the cause. I said, I know what cause you're talking about. The only cause I have is to share information. Everything I wrote here is quoted. Their names of the police officials. My cause is to get the information out. They, spite as it be, the story, the editor herself wrote, perhaps five or six paragraphs using some basic information. The rally was going to be held uh, you know, three days hence in D.C. It was moving along fine. If you want a couple of quotes from the black organizers, which we already had in my story, and that was what ran that week's paper. That's probably the greatest example of something that was very good and was very accurate and thorough. Being spiked, it does happen. I don't know if any of you others have something like that. But it really hurt that I would really stumble upon something good being on a smaller publication, and the, the larger meeting didn't have this. And to, to lose this good story hurt, but I realized that was part of the process, and I understood. I genuinely wasn't that mad at the owners, and I kind of expected it might happen once I followed the story, but I felt inside, you know, in the hour, hour and a half, I spent writing it all physically. This is what I had to do. This was the right thing to do. When, when I first started in television in, in 78, the sales department in the TV station literally was not allowed to come into the news department and vice versa. That has changed tremendously. As you know, when you watch a newscast now, this sportscast brought to you by Nike, this one brought to you, you know, this weather report brought to you by so and so. From a management perspective, it was always a fight for me to make sure that sales did not influence the coverage of the story. We would take the, the, the um, if we did a story on McDonald's, our responsibility was to make sure that the McDonald's commercial didn't run immediately after the McDonald's story. But, but it never killed, but we never killed the story or said we weren't gonna run the story. Now, was the sales department happy about that? Absolutely not, but that's part of the business. If you're gonna have a, a true, uh, uh, newsroom, then you've got to keep sales and news separate. And so there are times where they bump heads. So it really depends on the integrity of the company that you work for also in terms of whether or not that story is going to work. The newspaper version of that is that you don't put the uh, story about the plane crash on the same page with the ad for United Airlines. Um, 
And I've had things that were toned down because they might have been in the advertiser. I never had a story of spike. I actually, not never had a, you know, I actually lost $100,000 for a story that I wrote once because I took a little journalistic license. <laughs> and while the fact was, while it was not in, while the fact is not incorrect, um, because I, basically I was listening and they, I was working for a consumer uh, unit. And I was, a woman had a problem from her state and she'd taken it to this car dealer, you know, and they screwed her basically. This is the basis of the story. But in the story I wrote, and she had several things inside the car. Well, all she had inside the car was an umbrella. That was a small point, but the owner of the car dealership was so angry that he canceled that quarter's advertising. To my boss's credit, they went to bat for me, because I was a young girl was then. They went to bat for me and you know, but they lost hundred thousand dollars from that quarter. So, you know, it, again, it comes down to to the balance. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I teach journalism here at Thomas Nelson, and one of the things I do teach my students is that they should be writers, perhaps, before they should be reporters, and they should study literature, and they should work on the quality of their writing, perhaps before they work on other reporting skills. Uh, my question is. Do you agree? Yeah. Uh, and then if you do so, maybe you could uh, tell them about some writers that perhaps they don't know uh, that they, they could study uh, in order to become better journalists. And I also write for, for Mr. Robbins. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to be a very good writer, and I think you should concentrate on that first. Because like you were saying, some stories can just be so boring, but a good writer can write the stuff that it makes it so interesting you like. Like one of our reporters, his, his name was Adam Owens, there was a church who did something, it used to be a restaurant, and it used to, and they were having some rally, and he wrote to it like the the, the, the church, the, uh, the plan for the service, you know, the menu, just how his writing made the story so interesting. I mean, it's, it could have been so boring, you know. But if you were talking about writing, I think if you want to be a TV writer, you should just listen to other, listen to, like maybe, you know, maybe Andy Fox. He's, he's, he's a good writer. You know, you listen to what he says, you know, how he says it. You know, just to be able to keep your attention. I, from what well, I was first told, when, if you can catch somebody's attention, then you're a good writer. And I didn't understand that concept until I was in an airport one time. We all had our backs turned towards the, towards the television, and, and they said something, you know, turn around. And your writing is going to catch, you know, for, for television, your writing is going to get them in, but the, your pictures and everything is what's going to keep them. But writing, your writing is definitely, if you can't write, it, I don't care what the interview is. You can't be a reporter. Get. You can't, you can't, you can't be a reporter. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't That's not true. Bob Woodward can't write a lick. Well, it's terrible. Terrible. Right. Yeah, but somebody else writes. Great reporter is a terrible writer. But the other benefit of focusing on your writing is even if you don't go on to be a journalist, you've got this great skill that you will that will always be valuable. <coughs> yeah. And there's I I can tell you how many people I've run into who can't put two words together. Um, and they and it doesn't help them in their careers, um, no matter what career. It's probably more or less important depending on what type of journalism you want to go into if you're you know if you're gonna be writing, writing stories for a daily paper. Uh, being a literary stylist is not as important as if you're going to be writing for a magazine like Harper's or the New Yorker. Um, as far as books, I would say anything great. Any um, it, years ago, I took a um, when I was kind of at a crossroads in my career, I, I took a advertising copywriting course. So I figured, well, maybe I can, might need to fall back on that. And this uh, um, guy from High Power Agency in New York. Uh, was asked that question um, in, in terms of advertising. What book would you recommend? And I'm, I'm sure people would expect him to say, you know, such and such by David Ogilvy or what have you. He said, fitting his weight, um, which I don't know if you know that, but it's, it's probably the most difficult um, novel ever written. And But his point was, it's about the possibilities of language. And so you can, I wouldn't look just to uh, great writers in the particular genre that you're interested in. I'd look to uh, everything, poetry, novels of the 19th century, as far as commentary, you know, all kind of television. 
As far as people who are just great wordsmiths turning themselves to journalism, I'd suggest Fear Loving on the Campaign Trail 72 by Hunter Thompson and uh, Miami and the Siege of Chicago by Edmund Mann. You know, I, I am stunned at the number of students who claim they want to be journalists who don't read. I don't get that. How can you be a journalist if you don't read? And, and you've got to read everything. You've got to read newspaper magazine, you've got to read books, you've got to be, you have got to be a vociferous reader, I think, in order to be a really good journalist. You because care about news, too. You have to care about the news, but you have to be informed. You can't just worry about your one little pie, the one little piece. Tom brought up a point before about connecting the dots. You know, and so especially if you go into a newsroom and you're a general assignment reporter, which you will start out being in your career, you will be the general assignment reporter. Rarely do you walk in the door and get assigned to a beat or become the health reporter or the online reporter or whatever. That's very rare. So most of the time you're going to be a general assignment reporter. And if you don't read and if you don't try to absorb as much about this place where we live and, and people and what's going on, then you'll have no perspective in terms of, of the stories that you're going to be required to cover. And you won't be able to connect the dots. And people will be able to see right through that. Absolutely. A lot of people like, especially television, I just want to be on TV. Yes. I hate that. You know, well, I'm telling you this, it, it, it is a lot of work. There is no, you know, a lot of people, I'll just, people like, you write your own stories? How do you think it comes about? You, know, I mean, you, you go out, you get the morning meetings, you get your stories. Half, I'd say half my day was spent in a, in, a, in a truck, on the phone, you know, going around getting stories. And I'm talking about sometimes we were the lead story at 5 and we were still out at 3 o'clock, you know, trying to get a story. We had to have our scripts there by, you know, for you. You have to know how to write, you have to know how to get it. Being on, just being in front of the camera. Not the gonna, least of the yeah, that, it's not going to get it. It's, it's, if you just want to be on TV, please don't do it. You know, because while it may seem glamorous and all this, it, it's so much work and behind the scenes, there's so much bickering going on between the people in the field and the people in the station because we feel like they don't know what we go through and we, they feel like they don't know what we go through. And there's nobody running behind you with a makeup brush, and there's nobody doing your hair, you and there's nobody doing any of that stuff. You have to do that yourself. Yeah, it's not, it's not as glamorous as you know. If, if you have to master the basics of what you're doing, and everything else will fall into place. You may see people who have gotten high up or, or semi-high, you know, maybe this market, because they're good looking or whatever, pretty soon your flaws are going to come out, and that's, that's as far as you're going to make it. You know, you're not, you're going to crash and burn, and you're going to wonder why. Well, everybody thought I was great. Well, you didn't have the basics of what you were doing. You know, it may work in the West, where it looks and whatever is what runs the newscast. But at real stage, you better know, you know, how to put it together. And writing to me is, is where is where you know it starts. I took a rather unconventional ride. Well, you don't want to hear this because uh, you have. You know, a lot of folks here that are, are readers or hopefully would be readers. I like to read myself. I was at the University of Virginia at the time when they changed the uh, requirements for English. I have had fewer English courses than most science majors under the guidelines the school changed. And what I did, I created a plan that I tailored myself. So I've had, for a liberal arts major, more economics than, than most liberal arts majors have, more a business track of any kind. I've had uh, some geography in, in a varied array of other courses, which helps me having general assignment and governmental background, as well as having to cover a lot of business or a weekly paper. It has really been helpful to have this varied background. It wasn't linked exactly to the classics that some of my friends were taking with the English classes. Uh, I would encourage everyone to read as much as they can if you're a student or others if you're not. <coughs> and what's very important, especially for the uh, print medium, is it's very important to be a good speller. Spell check <coughs> is way overrated and it, it doesn't pick up a lot and you, you shouldn't really use it as a, as a crutch. Uh, it, in the newsroom, too many people are using it. And also, by reading a lot, 
things that have nothing to do with great literature, although some of the books that were mentioned are very good. What's also very good are modern day things like magazines, the current literature of the day. This way, you as a reporter are getting abreast, especially if you're a general assignment, of what your field might be. Like we were asked questions earlier about the political race. There was some other one there we haven't gotten to about national events. You, you have more of an understanding of your world. So yeah, if one of these national level people comes here, you, you can wing it uh, of sorts. Uh, a good example, I know I'm talking a little long, but this will illustrate. Earlier in my career, uh, Michael Manley, who was the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, spoke in Norfolk. And Manley gave, you know, a perfunctory kind of talk, the same talk he gives, you know, 20 minutes at all these campuses, I guess. And they had a few other media there, and then, you know, he answered a few half-hearted questions. And then they had some one-on-ones. And I went in my turn at, you know, like five minutes or so with the gentleman, perhaps 10. And it was going horribly. I mean, it was, it was bored out of his mind. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, what can I do to salvage this interview which is going to come alive? Well, I'm thinking, how can I relate? I pull out from memory a point from an economic geography class back in undergraduate school. And I throw out a question, uh, what is the current uh, situation of Bozite in your country? His face lights up like, how in the heck did I know that his country was the world's leading producer of aluminum ore? Courtesy of a course I had in college a while back, which totally saved the interview. He and I were best friends for five minutes. He, you know, he loved me like uh, the other reporters have never, you know, been doing background, and they sent me off on quick notice. This was before the internet. I couldn't even do any background on who the guy was. I mean, I you know, read his name a few times on the paper. And so sometimes this, the knowledge from us, another unrelated class, can really save you know, yourself and turn what's very dry and boring into something real and bring the person out. The celebrity then becomes a friend, a professional friend, if you will. And it, you, know, you go beyond just another beat reporter. You become something special, at least for a moment in time. I just wanted to add um, a couple other books to the list, before I'm making a list. Um, one of my favorites that I tell people to read if they're asking about reading about writing is um, Stephen King's On Writing, which is a really cool book. Um, it's a real fast read. You can read it in you know, one sit down. Um, an author that I particularly like the voice of is Frances Mays. Um, she, um, she's probably a Czech writer. She writes about um, her living in um, Italy. Um, but she just has this great flair for the description and this great ability to describe. And I like I like reading that kind of writing that reminds me that I don't just have to say that the seven people were sitting at a table, but that they were sitting at a table that was draped with green cloth, or you know anything that reminds you that that, that there's that there's a lot of rich detail. I think it's always good. Well, I see our time is gone. I appreciate everyone for coming, and I especially appreciate our journalists to come and help and give advice. Now we have a new friend, so hopefully uh, they'll answer emails if you send it if you have other questions. But I appreciate it, and I hope you have a great evening. Thank you.